All right. Well, welcome, Mark. Hey, good to see you, Greg. Good to see you too, alive and well in your home office, as I am here in New York in the lockdown zone. So we met in Nashville. And how's Nashville doing? I mean, Nashville is such a great town with musicians everywhere, but probably musicians are nowhere to be found right now in Nashville. Have you been through the city? Yeah, they uh, closed down a lot of the bars, a lot of... Uh, a lot? It took a little while. That- yeah, all of them. Yeah, it's pretty much all of them. Yeah, it's, it's been shut down, but it took a little while. In the beginning, they didn't actually shut everything down. Yeah. And it took a lot longer, but now everything is pretty much locked down and required to be locked down. So only essential services, which I'm sure a lot of the country is in that now. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, before we get into, uh, you know, talking about life and, and, you know, post COVID world, um, first of all, I want to welcome anyone that's in this broadcast. This is not a podcast. This is a live chat on Good Friday here in April. So welcome. If you uh, hear me, just say, Hey, what's going on? And, uh, Tell us where you're from, what town, what city, and uh, how you're holding up, hunkering down. Um, so, Mark, tell us a little bit about the work that you do just uh, in a normal world, and then we'll go into the post-COVID world in a minute. You know, it's 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 interesting. You know, it's uh, pretty much the same thing I do all the time. I, I have people think about their business and what it could look like. So... Pre-COVID, it was what processes, what are you doing, how can you improve? You know, do you question what you do on a regular basis to see if there's a way to change it so you don't miss what your business could look like? So, for example, you know, people like Airbnb disrupted an industry in Casper with the mattress industry and other things, and it's because no one thought you could be disrupted. It's like we've got it, we own it, and a lot of people and a lot of businesses are kind of believing, you know, we're good, you know, this is fine. Well, what COVID did is made people think, wow, okay, we're not fine. And even if we thought we we're fine, there's actually a different priority. You actually have to think about your people in a different way. And yeah. we didn't have to care that way before. Yeah. So we thought about all that and just kind of talked to those forward-looking entrepreneurs, business leaders, CEOs, and said, if you look in one area where you're not looking and does it matter? And then when will it matter? Mm. Yeah. So, you know, I was talking yesterday with my friend Kyle about how now it's the businesses that are going to survive. Uh, didn't matter how strong they were, how established they were. It's now how well are they adapting to the new world, to their new staff, to their new uh, ways that they need to serve their customers. And so mm-hmm. it's adaptability that's going to um, have businesses survive or not right now. Can you, can you figure stuff out? Can you be creative? Can you experiment? Can you get things wrong quickly? Because everybody's getting things wrong quickly right now. Mm-hmm. So do you have any projects in the house now that are like new that you've gotten in the time of COVID? I'm curious. Yeah, so there is margin now. People have forced margin. So some of the things that we're doing is having conversations with people and saying, you can't be working exactly as you were before. So either now you're working in a different environment, so you have different distractions, but there's got to be some time where we can start thinking about other things in your business. So I've had conversations about clients and say, what about, what does your team look like? How would the things have to change for your team? So things start to gel better. If you had a communication issue with your organization before, when you used to just walk into somebody's door and say, hey, let's have a chat. And you can't do that now because everything is Zoom or WebExes. Yeah. That's that communication breakdown is kind of really showing now. Showing. So I'm reaching out to all our clients and being like, okay, well, where are you? Think you're communicating and you really weren't because it's showing now. Yeah. So so help yeah. help me and help uh, folks that are watching this now really understand where you help uh, businesses and also describe the ideal kinds of businesses that you work with, small, medium, large, and how you help them move the needle. You know, in, what, in what capacity do you help them? So so far in my career, I've worked in 10 different industries, helping everything from manufacturing all the way to healthcare to legal. And what they all have in common is that they realize that if they don't disrupt what they're doing and they don't think in new ways and innovate, then literally somebody will come along and disrupt them. So 
I'm ideally looking to work with CEOs and leaders of organizations or even side larger organizations. I've worked with a Fortune 150 healthcare organization that was not in Nashville, but was in New Jersey mm -hmm. and work with them. And I worked with a division of theirs for 18 years doing literally innovative work, thinking about the way they think about technology, actually interacting with the way that they work with other people. And all it came down to was there was a corporate mandate to do things a certain way. And we just questioned, well, what could it look like if we actually did things a little bit differently? Yeah. So, so leaders that think differently and want help, someone to help and enact some of those ideas are the ones that have conversation with me and we get people on board and we actually uh, work through that right. and what it looks like with a real plan. So we got Douglas Green in the house. I used to work with Douglas and Douglas, you know, you've worked in healthcare for a gazillion years as well. And uh, Mark, you've been helping healthcare companies um, evolve, mm -hmm. adapt. Um, speaking of healthcare, you know, right now healthcare is uh, our lifeline. You know, helping our grandparents or mm -hmm. uh, people that are suffering, and they these people on the front lines. So, do you see any work that you've done, like any of your customers, um, like what part of healthcare, what part of the healthcare value chain have you have you worked with? Well, I've worked with healthcare with mostly with uh, um, their creative, right? So how they, they get messaging out. So is it typical messaging where it's, you know, this was in um, medical device industry. So it was not on the front line where it was like vacutainers and other products that were in healthcare. Every office you see it, but it's kind of behind the scenes. Nobody really glamorizes it. It's just what the tools you need to be able to work in healthcare. So helping them understand that there's a messaging issue, understanding that there's a technology aspect to it, how you function, how you're seeing. Let's stop there. I mean, let's dig into this. When you say a messaging mm -hmm. issue, like wh what sort of issue do you see in healthcare about messaging? Well, a lot of times with healthcare, what they do is, is they try to tell you that, you know, I, I got a book behind me that talks about healthcare being broken, talked about that that issue. I, I don't really want to dive into political aspects or things like that. What I talk about is that you have people in an organization that are have ideas that if they're not heard from, then these ideas can't actually expand to help the business. A lot of people call them entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So you think about people inside your organization and actually have creative ideas, but because they don't have a title or because they really are not empowered to be able to change because the organization is so large, how do those people's voices get heard? Or so squashed. They, they're just squashed most of the time. Right. Or when you do present an idea, because these because a lot of employees don't have a full plan with an ROI, yeah. they look at those ideas and go, that'll never work. Yeah. Well, my job is to go and actually yeah, they, take those ideas. Kibosh on it. Yeah. And that's but that's typical. And, and and that's what I see in multiple organizations. I just use healthcare as one. You could pick an organization like manufacturing and go, well, you know, Mark, they're always innovating. I was like, okay, they're innovating. So what's going on with Tesla and, you know, electric cars. And is it really about electric cars or is it people demanding for different ways for transportation or is it about the environment? Right. What are we missing? How do you help these companies that are stodgy and their culture is top down and they don't listen to ideas that come from anybody and they squash ideas, they kibosh ideas and people who are in the organization put the kibosh on everybody else's ideas. Mm -hmm especially mm -hmm. you know, senior managers that say, hey, let's do this. And everyone's like, yeah, yeah, sure, whatever. I mean, how do you, how do you deal with that? How do you actually move the needle there? So, you know, I, I've been around many different organizations. And what I start with is just the conversation. You know, Greg, you and I had a conversation at a moment where you were introspecting about some of the things in your life, right? So I was invited in at that moment. We were sitting at the same table to have a conversation. I saw what was going on in your head. And then you spoke about it. We didn't know each other. What are we talking about? Remind, remind me. <laughs> well, this was about, we were thinking about um, life, right? And really thinking about some what? things that affected your life. It was, uh, oh, really? you know, I'm okay to talk about it. What, uh, but but what, what it was, but I don't want to focus specifically on that. What I'm saying is that when you are around people and listen, okay, meaning collectively, yeah, people will tell you what's the most important thing on their mind. Yeah. And if you listen and repeat it back, you can hear how much they care about an organization or what ideas they have. And then you hear well, who are you also spreading that idea with? My job is to always listen to what people say. So I can say, well, who else believes that? Is this a good enough idea? Is there a hypothesis behind this? Do you want to leave and start a startup, which I do not help with startups, 
Mm-hmm. Or is this something that should stay inside your organization, get funded and get moved forward and presented so it's a better idea than just a, hey, why don't we try this? Right. That's that, my right. role. Yeah, it has legs. It has a beginning, middle and end and a process. And right. So you help uh, take the ger- you germinate ideas with people and help them, um, I would say, manifest that idea in their organization to better the mission of the company and impact people's lives in the case of healthcare. Yeah, it's it's called turning conversations into outcomes. So here, uh, Steve, founder and CEO of iBrand, said, hey, Doug and Mark, I think that's uh, Greg and Mark. My name is Greg, by the way, Steve. Nice to meet you. Uh, interested to know Mark's thoughts on those businesses who believe that once the world opens up again, they can just pick up where they left off. What is the one thing you can say to them that makes them realize that they must change the way they think about their customers and their business? Yeah. The biggest thing about thinking about your customers and your business is that you got to see a side of your customers you didn't normally see before, right? There was a, there's a chain here that's actually delivering groceries that only delivered normally food, but is now actually picking up doing groceries. There's another organization here in Nashville that to stay open, they were actually packaging food for the homeless and you were buying meals so they can actually deliver to the homeless so they could get money as an organization and stay in business, but they can also feed people. Mm-hmm. So I think we're seeing, it's not just about delivery. It's not just about a profit. You're seeing people expose themselves, if you want to or not, to find out that these are real living people that have real issues that now when you're in their homes, you're finding out. So what's COVID after? If you don't care and start to um, empathize or sympathize with your employees, they're never going to be as loyal as you want them to be. Ever, ever. And they're gone. (laughs) Because this is the most vulnerable they've been. And your companies also be vulnerable. And guess what? Now that we've seen how the sausage is made and it's been made on your kitchen table and you didn't want it there, yeah. now let's be real. Now, it doesn't mean you have to be soft. It doesn't mean profit's still not important. It means now that we know this, if you don't change, what you're really saying is we don't care. Yeah. And if you say that, your employees are going to go and say, well, we're gone and we're not coming back. Even by not saying anything is saying right. we don't care. Yes. Yes. So... so- Douglas uh, mentioned something here. It's interesting. And I know Douglas knows a ton about the healthcare industry. Uh, Healthcare businesses nationally is down as people shelter in place, but those areas most affected are swamped. We have seen a tremendous increase on the insurer side with member communications. How do insurers create effective communications to drive behavioral change? So I think Douglas is talking about behavioral change inside the organization. Yeah. So if you look at what changes behavior, right, in a profit-driven organization, it's usually what what can we make or do to be able to go and get to where we want to get. If if it's only profit-driven, we've seen during this time, look at the pains that people are feeling because profit was key. There's a lot of people helping, right? There's a lot of, you know, we talked about personal protection, equipment and other things. There's people making masks. There's people donating. There's people doing things. Here, here's my bandana, by the way. <laughs> it's funny. So here's my wife made one for me and I'm a Nashville Preds fan. So here's my Nashville Preds one. <laughs> so, but the thing is, is that you look at this and you go, that wasn't about profit. It was about need. So yeah. if you want to change the narrative, how do you keep, I mean, the question back to Doug is how do you keep people thinking about what the narrative is during down times, during difficult times that we keep going consistently after those times have passed? How do you change mindset to have people think about, it's not just about the urgent, but do we really care long-term? Are we going to continue to ebb and flow? Yeah, so now these employees that they have are all working from home and the only sort of connection they have with their bosses and their colleagues is email and Zoom meetings. And, you know, um, I think people are realizing now that they don't know how to run Zoom meetings. They don't know how to connect with people and empathize and to, you know, there's a lot of technical problems. Most of the problems, sometimes people can't hear, people can't see. But assuming everyone is in place and, like, you can hear and see everyone, 
there's a lot of like chaos, like the purpose of the meeting is often not clear. People jump in and take it on tangents. So I think that we're living now in a world where people are realizing that they don't even have the skills to manage effective conferences, meetings, and presentations remotely. They're realizing they don't have those skills. They don't know how to do it. Everyone is trying to figure it out right now. And I think the people who have those skills and have figured it out are going to do better with their teams, with their customers. Bottom line, they're going to do better. Yeah. And that's the thing is, is that it goes back to if you did it poorly before, this really rips off the Band-Aid to everybody knows what you've done wrong and how it's exposed now. Yeah. And that's not a bad thing. I, I like that what you've tried to cover up by, you know, they, whoever it is, cover up by just doing it the way you were doing it. We'll get by. This will be fine. Let's just have a meeting. We have a weekly stand up. Yeah. What are you really accomplishing? Is there any action points, right? The, the memes that say this could have easily been a memo instead <laughs> of, right? I mean, yeah, <laughs> this could have been an email and, yeah. and adding Slack as yeah. a communication method to solve all the problem no. wasn't ever the solution. You need to show it prepared to your presentations, to your meetings with a focus, with an agenda, with questions that you want to ask, what you want to get out of the people mm -hmm. that are there. Using polling feature is a great feature that Zoom mm -hmm. can't even do in a room full of people. You can do it with Zoom. Very mm -hmm. few people are taking advantage of the polling feature in Zoom right now. Well, if you didn't, if you weren't trained correctly in the beginning to do something, <laughs> yeah. throwing you into the fire and then saying, okay, let's just do it now. Yeah. It's not going to solve it. Right. Yeah. So there's going to be people that come out and evolve and look and go, hey, you know what? There's, do we need all these meetings? But let's just think post COVID. When people get back together, they're going to be a little concerned in the beginning because this may not go away, like as in the flu which comes back and there may not be a vaccine that's perfectly um, figured out because even the flu every year, people get it. We have a flu shot. How does that work? Right? Yeah. So, <laughs> this, <laughs> that is that. So, <laughs> so you look at the things that are still problems and I'm just like, <laughs> yeah. So uh, these are my zoom, uh, my, my coasters here uh, to like, you know, interrupt people when they're doing stuff on zoom meetings because those are good. Because it's not, you don't even have to make any sound. You can even be on mute and just be like, hello, people. So like, I'm just encouraging people in their Zoom meetings to be as creative as possible using mm -hmm. tools you have. You have to be visual. You have to be vocal. Mm -hmm. When it's your turn to speak on Zoom. I've been on too many Zoom meetings recently where there's like nine people. Everyone's off of mute, and it's chaos. You don't know what the hell's going on. And so another best practice is the host of the meeting has to keep everybody on mute, mm -hmm. basically make an announcement. Look, I'm going to take everyone off mute. When I do that, everyone put yourself on mute unless you want to answer a question or talk. This way, it's not just chaos. Mm -hmm. It's a basic um, communication rule you got to do in a Zoom in order for things to go forward. I've also seen, that's a great best, best practice. I've also seen people have to name somebody else who's supposed to go next. Yeah. So instead of it being random, it's a, yeah. yeah. You call it a batting order. You got to get the batting order. There's nine people here. Right. You're one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine with names. And we go around the room. But uh, you can also do, let's see a show of hands. Like mm -hmm. that's simple. Show of hands. What do you think about, you know, making it on May 12th? Raise your hand. So you don't have to do polls. You can do a show of hands because that's visual. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that this is a time for all of us to fail, to figure it out, to experiment. And the folks that are brave enough, courageous enough to figure it out in their own business with their teams and their customers are going to do well. And the folks that are hunkering down and um, not experimenting and, not, and too fearful to adapt, I don't think so. Not going to do well for them. Right, right. And that's okay. Because it proves we're going to separate those who get it and who have learned the lesson. And we didn't ask for this, but now that we're here, what are we going to do about it, right? What is going to change? So are you going to go to more remote meetings? Do you need everybody in the office, right? Is there another way to do this? Yeah, no, will it, will it change? Um, so speaking about that change, you know, for the companies that lay off people, I mean, so maybe there's some, a lot of a lot of folks are unemployed right now, and their companies had to, you know, lay them off. And post COVID, a lot of those companies are going to hire many of those people back. But 
A, will they hire them back in the same job at the same pay? Will they hire them back for a different job for lower pay? Will they not hire them back at all? And will those people really look at either finding a new job or offering what they do as a service, you know, um, uh, service as a service <laughs> and become, you know, uh, start a business, start a small entrepreneur business to become a W9, the transformation from a W2 to a W9. Mm -hmm. I think business after COVID, there's going to be millions, I don't know the number, a lot, a lot of people that are going to make this migration from working for a company to working for themselves. Uh, yes. Because maybe they've been let down by companies or maybe companies they've, you know, we've all been let down. You know, fucking COVID. Bam. You know? But I think that the way business will look, look very different after this. And I think the difference will be the trend, the transformation, the trend, you know, from taxis to Uber. You know, the people, you know, the gig economy. Mm -hmm. That gig economy is going to explode, in my view, after COVID. Oh, yeah. Of businesses, they will have, they'll be rebuilding themselves and they may realize that it may be more advantageous for them to build in a gig economy, you know, to hire the services they need instead of all the employees they had before. Yeah, and, and because that, of that, yeah. Are you to say that? Is that okay for me to say that shit? Or like, what do you? <laughs> well, I think the opportunity comes that people will make a switch after this, right? So that's pretty obvious that there will be people that are going to be entrepreneurs and doing things. What concerns me, and again, I'm always trying to protect people from themselves, is if you weren't built for being an entrepreneur, yeah, then make sure you go to an incubator, make sure you go and because, you know, the E-Myth Revisited, that long that book a long time ago that talks about the person who wanted to bake cakes and said, oh, I'll start my own bakery, but then hated collections and sales and everything else. Yeah. All they want to do is bake cakes. I'm just concerned that some people are going to go, okay, I'm fed up. I'm just going to start something. What I want them to do is be around other people that actually can help them do all the things they hate doing. Right. right? Yeah. So, so that, you know, that's Amazon helped a lot of people become drivers and then there was a bunch of other things that these drivers didn't want to do and were tasked with. Yeah. And now you're like, you got a really dis disgruntled independent contractor workforce. Right. So Tina, welcome, Tina. Hello, Tina. How's it going? Thanks for joining. Where are you coming in from, by the way? If you're watching this, uh, just type in what city you're in. Uh, so Tina's saying, what are the most uh, pressing challenges related to technologies facing healthcare companies today? You, maybe you can comment on that, Mark. I know that you are much more knowledgeable about healthcare companies and their uh, their their kryptonite when it comes to technology. Yeah, it's it's. I guess it's not just tech, uh, not just the healthcare, but it's a lot of organizations that uh, resist change for moving forward with technology. Right. The more people, the more you have in your organization, the more in entrenched you are, the slower it is to move forward. And then when you do move forward, like I've seen companies migrate to SAP, or I've seen my companies migrate off of Lotus Notes. Lotus Notes, okay, let's go back that. Okay, yeah, laugh. <laughs> I've seen them drag their feet to move off of Lotus Notes to Office 365 and the Office Suite. And I saw that be just literally a disaster because there were so many tens of thousands of people worldwide at different locations that had to do it. So there's a reason why they waited so long. Understand that it's... It, incrementalism seems to work if you have in your organization the ability for them to think and try and test and have somebody go first, right? That's organizations, not everybody's Google, where they're like, hey, let's come up with something new. Yeah. And that's what I see. I see organizations that actually embrace um, looking forward and actually have within their organizations the ability for them to be creative but in a way where they don't kind of squash it by having this right. oversight. So let's talk about it. Organizations aren't creative. Uh, <laughs> people are creative. True. Organizations do not suffer. People suffer. People <laughs> die of COVID. Organizations yeah. don't die of COVID. Mm -hmm. So I want to draw a real distinction here. Like when you say, you know, that organizations are not, you know. It's a culture. It's a culture thing, though. What I'm saying is not the people. It comes from who? Who? In right. It, it, but it comes from the way when you go into an organization. So Google is an organization, right? And and you say exactly what I say. I said I don't work for organizations. I work for people that actually run organizations. Mm -hmm. So when you think about it, 
there's a culture of innovation. There's a culture of we allow people to be empowered to make decisions. If you're working in any organization, healthcare or not, and you don't have the power to be able to make any kind of changes or recommend anything, here's the perfect example, right? You go to cable companies or your cell phone company and you call with a complaint and they're like, oh, I can't, I can't authorize that. I got to talk to somebody else. So I was like, okay, so why am I talking to somebody who can't do even a five hour credit to fix something that's broken that would, because, yeah. so that's not even healthcare. That's, te that's telecommunication, but it's not the way the organization is because they've locked down costs, they've yeah. taken away controls, and they've changed the culture, which hurts everyone. They, they, it comes down ultimately to a CEO. I'm sorry. It comes down to somebody in the organization, and I blame the CEO. So speaking of which, uh, a lot of CEOs are bringing in healthcare telemedicine. So Douglas, and you know, I, I love uh, Teladoc. That's one mm -hmm. vendor or one whatever uh, platform. And so, yeah, my daughter uses Teladoc. I use it. My son uses it. We get on. We schedule a time with a the doctor. They look in your throat with the phone. They see in there and they prescribe medication. And that's awesome. And now it's critical. It's absolutely mm -hmm. critical right now for people with sore throats and people who are just mm -hmm. sick and they don't have COVID to have, um, you know, a Teladoc kind of platform. How many are there out there of these platforms? You know, Aetna uses Teladoc, I'm not sure, Cigna and State Farm and Kaiser, they're all using different platforms. Mm -hmm. But I think that's a great uh, adaptation of digital uh, in healthcare. You know, that's really- It is, it is. And, and actually you watch with the Apple Watch or other things where there's limitations of what they can do, but now having the ability to have be monitored with technology to be able to know what the limitations and expectations are, I think is important with any new technology is to be aware and say, well, where's the limit? Because we want to push the limit. We're like, oh, can it detect COVID? And Apple's like, no, right now the Apple Watch can't because it can't do everything you want, but we have an app so you can self-diagnose. And with telehealth, you can do certain things. Yeah. So, so like you know, a friend of mine right now is in New York City and she is sick. Um, she uh, thinks she has COVID. And um, I'm not exactly sure how she's going to get tested or if she can get tested or what the protocol is for testing. So, I mean, right now, testing for COVID is a problem mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. if you don't know you have it, um, well, you should assume you have it mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, in terms of your behavior and where, you know, lockdown. But still, um, I think, uh, yeah, this is a problem. Is that a problem? Yeah. Well, you know, right now, there's, they've FDA is allowed there to be more tests and, you know, they usually have an 18 month to two year process and now there are other tests. And so the thing is, is that we have to ramp up. Where do you go to get the tests? Like you can't, you know, but there's web again in Nashville and Tennessee, there's websites that tell you, you know, Vanderbilt here's has a lot of clinics and you can go to clinics and there's other things. So they pr pr um, provide a lot of the information where you can get swab. They have to have drive up swabbing places here. And but too. In New York, there's only like two or three places right now. but not Which is amazing that that's how yeah. limited it is. We have more places in Nashville than you have in New York, which seems crazy to me. It is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and that's, but it's up to local government, right? We, we want to not talk about politics and government, but ultimately it comes down to people, what, <laughs> people in government. <laughs> it always comes down to people. <laughs> uh so when you got to go over the border in your car by yourself to go and be able to get tested somewhere else, that's pretty pathetic because yeah. Jersey has a lot less cases. But I'm not driving to Nashville to get tested. <laughs> <laughs> I'm to Nashville to listen to music when this shit is over, but <laughs> get tested. Yeah. So it's the the thing is with a lot of a lot of people. Again, if you presume you have it, mm -hmm. since there's really no treatment, and I'm not a doctor, I'm not even trying to pretend to be one or on TV. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just looking at saying that you got to isolate, right? That's really the answer. Yeah. Yeah. So, but th think about it, Greg, as you kind of go through this, what we have a lot of things that are happening that are out of our control, yeah. but what do we have in our control, right? Yeah. What can we start doing? Who can we reach out to, right? When are you going to start going through our LinkedIn list and being like, Hey, I'm just calling you. Don't want anything other than just make sure you're okay. Yeah. And people you haven't talked to in a really long time. What about that personal connection? Do that, folks. If you're watching this, it's a good time to actually go through your number one first circle connections and actually like, oh, who is this person? Hello, how are you doing? <laughs> because uh, the relationships that you can build now, just 
from a human level are the ones that will blossom or can't have the possibility to blossom after all this is over. Mm -hmm. That's what you're talking about now, right? Yeah, it's, you should be doing it anyhow. Yeah. That's the pathetic part, right? So you went to college with somebody, you knew somebody from her last job, and when's the last time you reached out to him? And again, there was no reason not to. It's not like you had bad blood. It's just you didn't. So why not? Yeah, now's the time. Right. Now's the time. Yeah, certainly. So as we wrap up here um, in this conversation, we're talking about what will post-COVID-19 business look like. We spent a lot of time talking about healthcare and organizational uh, dysfunction and stodginess, and, and, what, and what we mean by that are essentially people, people who are either thinking they don't need to adapt and change or don't have an entrepreneurial mindset within that organization that begins to restrict people in that company from thriving. And ultimately, those people are going to leave eventually. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're not going to also, as a CEO, not going to see the value that those people have because you're not really involving them. You're not enrolling them in in uh, ingenuity, in innovation, and uh, internal entrepreneurship. I think you call that intrapreneurship, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as we wrap up, what are your thoughts? Uh, hey, hello, Stephanie from Palm Springs, California. Welcome. And looks like, Tina, you're from Irvine. What's going on, Tina in Irvine? Irvine's a nice place. So anyway, so as we wrap up here, what would you like to uh, to either recap or emphasize here as we re re recap this? You know, it's it all comes down to people, as we kind of spoke about. But inside an organization, with people, there are people desperate for someone to hear them and know that there's more that can be done with this group, right? You're working here, you're entrusted in an organization. Why not reach out to somebody like me or you and just kind of have this conversation and say, what can be done? Let me show you a little perspective, right? My role is to show you perspective first and then work within your organization to help other people see that same perspective. And I've been doing that for half my life, right? So my career has been about coaching and consulting with organizations to literally take all those dialogues in their head about things that could happen and starting to bring them to life. And it's exciting when you watch organizations get it because those people all get the benefit of some of your ideas that were never really brought to light because you didn't have a chance. So I, I, I want I want to really make sure that people understand that it's it's not about an industry, it's about a mindset. And now is a great time because people are listening Ooh. in ways they'd never listened before. <laughs> so true. So with that, I'm gonna just put up a couple uh funny faces and I wanna thank you, Mark, for joining this LinkedIn live sales therapy show. Um, if you have any advice uh, for me about what you think would be really great on this show, let me know. Uh, but I really appreciate having you. And I appreciate anyone here who's been watching. Thank you. And guys, stay home, stay safe. God bless. And uh, we'll see you soon. Take care.